Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. After 16 years of marriage, even a week of playing Bachelor can get old. As my alarm went off Thursday morning, I reached over to shut it off and, without thought, rolled back over to give Meg a hug and kiss before getting up to shower. But she wasn't there. She was at the Athletic Association Conference and wouldn't be getting back until Saturday. With the kids away at camp for another two weeks, I was alone in the house. So, I groaned, stretched, and started the process of making myself presentable. I was going to have a hard time getting up the energy to make it into the office again today. It's strange. Usually, I have no problem getting ready to go into work. I enjoy my job and look forward to the challenges that I face each day. But this last week has been difficult. I found it hard to go into work when I knew that Meg was away at a high-class resort enjoying the conference. I envied her. It felt like she was away on vacation while I was stuck at home. I'm not sure why this week was different. Meg is a teacher, so I have gotten used to her getting to sleep in while I went to work during school breaks. Nevertheless, the thought of playing hooky flashed through my mind. As I drove into work that morning, I realized that what was making me envious was Meg's excitement during our daily phone conversations. She wasn't telling me about the meetings and sessions, she was talking about the fun she was having with Judy and her friends as they made the round of the afternoon and nighttime activities. Her call the day before had been a prime example. When she left for the conference, she was convinced that her boss Frank was going to try to seduce her. We had talked about it and came up with a strategy for dealing with Frank if he did try something. By yesterday's call, she had decided that Frank had given up on his plans so she was free to enjoy the remainder of the conference in peace. The rest of the phone call was a blur. She went on and on about her plans in great excitement. She was so happy and excited that I could barely get a word in edgewise. I don't think she even thought about how I would react. I was happy she was having a good time, but deep down I resented the fact that she could have such a good time without me. It sounded like she had forgotten that she was a wife and mother. I wondered if she thought about me at all once she hung up the phone. A further irritation came from her companions. During our call on Tuesday, she had talked about what a good time she had had dancing the past few nights. When I asked her whom she was dancing with, she rattled off the names of four guys, Phil, Wayne, Sam, and Art. It turns out that her new group of friends was four men and three women. Not only was she out having a good time, she was getting wined and dined by some guys that I didn't know. I trusted Meg, but there was something about the whole situation that caused my hackles to rise. Did they act like four couples when they were out together? In short, I was jealous. I was bothered by the good time that Meg was having with her new friends while I was stuck working. I was bothered by the fact that it did not appear that she missed me at all. My ego was hurting. Could I be forgotten and replaced that easily? As I sat in traffic, I thought about how I was feeling and felt foolish. I had no reason to be envious or suspicious of Meg. I was just getting burnt out and in need of a vacation myself. It had been a long time since I had gotten away from the office for more than a day or two. I needed to get away. I was going to talk to my boss that morning, get the next week off, and surprise Meg with an impromptu vacation. It was time to dust off the camping equipment, haul out the canoe, and revisit some old haunts. I knew just the trip to take, a route through the lakes, rivers, and ponds of the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. It was a leisurely paddle that Meg and I have enjoyed in the past. The route was not well-traveled and the chances of spotting wildlife and a variety of waterfowl were excellent. However, the best part of the trip was the fact that there were plenty of private campsites. I wanted to spend some quality time alone with Meg before Brad and Sarah got back from summer camp. When I got into the office, I went to see my boss, Jim Thompson. To my relief, he was willing to give me the week off even on such short notice. He smiled at me and said, For God's sake, Dawn, it's about time you figured it out. You need a break. You've been snapping at people all summer, and that's not like you. I know, Jim, I replied with a sigh. Between the conference that my wife is at, Sarah's gymnastic camp, and Brad's soccer camp, this summer has been crazy. I didn't think I was going to be able to afford to take the time off, so I have been trying to gut it out. On the way in today, I realized how jealous I was of Meg being at that conference. When I start getting jealous because she gets to go to a conference for her job, then I'm beginning to lose it. I figured I'd better take a vacation before I do something stupid. Jim laughed and told me to enjoy myself. Take that pretty wife of your away for a while and show her some attention. If you don't watch out, someone is going to steal her away from you. I laughed at Jim's comment and went back to my office to start my day, but his comment struck a nerve. It seemed a little too close to my worries from earlier that day. Was she missing me? Later that afternoon, I called Meg for our daily chat. But as soon as she picked up the phone, 
I could tell that her mood had shifted radically from the day before. She sounded jumpy and her mind wasn't on our conversation. After talking with her for a few minutes, it was obvious that something was bothering her. Meg, what's going on? Is something wrong? I queried. What? No, nothing's wrong. I'm just tired. She stammered. Are you getting tired of cooking for yourself yet? I knew something was up. For the last three days our phone conversations had been about the conference and what a good time she was having. Now she wouldn't talk to me. Meg, don't try to change the subject. Something is bothering you. I can tell. What's wrong? Did something happen today? Dawn, there is nothing wrong. Nothing happened. I told you. I'm just tired. I couldn't get to sleep last night. I had a lot on my mind and couldn't get comfortable without you to cuddle into. What was bothering you? You were so happy yesterday. Did something happen to you after our conversation? I pressed. Shit. Did Frank try to hit on you again? I'll kill him. No. I told you it's nothing. Frank has been a perfect gentleman. I just got to thinking about us and started to miss you. Meg. Look. She interrupted harshly. Drop it, please. I told you it was nothing for you to worry about. Meg caught herself and went on in a softer tone. I promise. I'll tell you all about it when I get home. Can we talk about something else? I knew I wasn't going to get anything else out of her right then. After 16 years of marriage, I have learned that when Meg doesn't want to hawk about something, it's not going to happen. All I could do is hope that whatever was bothering her was not major and would keep until she got home. I gave in and changed the subject. So, tell me, what's on tap for today? Any special plans? I asked. I don't know. She replied softly. I'm supposed to get together with Judy, Dee Dee and Rachel, but I'm not sure if I'm going to go. I might just take a nap. What about tonight? Are you heading out for another night of dinner, drinking and dancing with the guys? I asked sarcastically. As soon as the words left my mouth, I regretted saying them. I knew that the tone of voice I used was bitter, but I couldn't help myself. I wasn't happy that she wouldn't talk to me about what was going on and I didn't like the idea of her going out with a group of guys I didn't know. What do you mean? She yelped, picking up on my tone of voice. Are you accusing me of something? You sound as if you're jealous. I know, I sighed. I think I'm jealous. It's just that all I have heard about since you got to the conference is what a great time you were having with your new friends. All day long I've been sitting here missing you, and I know it's stupid, but I'm feeling left out and sorry for myself. I just can't stop worrying about these other guys and the good times you are having with them. I'm sorry. I'm not accusing you of anything. I love you and trust you too much for that. I know that you would never do anything to hurt our marriage. Just forget I said anything. When I finished, Meg didn't say anything for a long time. When she did speak, her voice was full of emotion. Don Prescott, she choked, you're not being stupid. I love you for worrying about me. Don't you ever forget that I love you more than anything. You are the only man that I have ever loved and nothing will ever change that. You have no reason to be jealous because there is no one who could ever mean as much to me as you do. After that we said our goodbyes and hung up. As I put down the phone, I thought I heard Meg bursting into tears, but I couldn't be sure. All I could do is stare at the phone. That had been one of the strangest calls that I had ever had. It was obvious that something was bothering Meg, but there was nothing I could do about it until she got home. I was feeling uneasy. Her reaction to my jealousy seemed out of character. I expected her to laugh at my concerns and tease me about it. Instead, she had broken out in tears and told me not to be jealous. Was she feeling guilty about something? And she never did tell me what her plans were for going out with her gentleman friends. To keep myself occupied, I threw myself into getting ready for our canoe trip. I decided to surprise Meg with the trip. By Saturday morning, I had picked up all the necessary supplies and everything was packed including her gear. I was going to pick her up at the airport and head directly out to the Adirondacks. We did talk on Friday, but the conversation was short and strained at times. The only things she wanted to talk about were the meetings that she had been to that day. She didn't say word one about our conversation from the day before. She also avoided my questions on what she had done the prior night or what she planned on doing that day. I wasn't sure if she was being considerate by not rubbing my nose in the fun she was having or if she was hiding something. She did give me some big news, however. Meg had been asked to become a member of the state competition committee. This was quite a coup for her and big boost for her career. I knew she had lots of ideas that she wanted to propose and this would give her a forum where she might be able to make a difference. I was excited for her, but she seemed conflicted. When I asked her why, she told me that the duties of the committee would require her to be away four times a year. 
Committee members met each summer for three days prior to the conference and were required to attend quarterly meetings in the fall, winter, and spring. She would be gone for 10 or more days in the summer and each of the quarterly meetings would mean at least four days away from home. Meg said she was worried about the amount of time that she would have to spend away from home. It worried me too, but I didn't want to let her know. I didn't want to be one of those husbands who let their fears get in the way of their wife's career. She told me that she was thinking about it and that she didn't have to give them a response right away. I let the subject drop. I figured that we would have a chance to talk more about it later. Meg was booked on an early flight home. Her return flight was due around 11, and I planned to leave for the trip right from the airport. We had about a four-hour drive, and it was about an hour's paddle into the first campsite I wanted to use. When Meg got off the plane, she was happy to see me, but she looked haggard and tired. There was tightness around her eyes that I did not like. She acted nervous and under stress. It was almost like she did not know what type of reception she would get from me. I kissed her quickly and hustled her over to the luggage carousel. I was thinking of the trip. I wanted to surprise her and get on the road as quickly as possible. We lucked out and her bag came out quickly. I grabbed it and we walked out to the SUV. When she saw the canoe on the roof, she looked at me with a question on her face. I smiled at her and said, surprise. I realized a few days ago that I was getting burned out. Jim gave me next week off, and I thought we can spend it up in the Adirondacks relaxing. Besides, I thought that we could use some time alone before the kids get home from camp. We're all set to get on the road. I even packed you a change of clothes if you want to change while we drive. Meg just looked at me. She seemed hesitant, almost apprehensive about going. I was surprised and hurt at her reaction. These trips alone have created some of my happiest memories. We were pretty sure that Brad had been conceived on one of these trips. One of my biggest regrets is that they don't happen as often as I like. We constantly bemoan the fact that we never get time to spend together. I had thought that this would be a great surprise, but it seemed that I was the one getting the surprise. Look, Meg, if you don't want to go, we don't have to. We can find something else to do. I told her. I'm sure I sounded testy. My tone of voice conveyed my disappointment and irritation at her reaction. Meg flushed and looked away guiltily. She had some reason for not wanting to go on the canoe trip. However, she knew how much these trips meant. I don't think she could come up with legitimate reason for not wanting to go. After a moment, she looked back at me with a forced smile on her face. No, it's okay. I was just surprised at all. Let's get going. I just stared at her. Meg, I'm serious. If you don't want to go, we won't. I'm not going to force you to do anything you don't want to do. I placed her suitcase in the car, got in, and waited for her to join me. Admittedly, I was steamed. I was also confused, but I wasn't going to make her go. I had given up on the trip and was planning on heading to the house. As Meg got in the car, I could see the tears in her eyes. She was going through an internal struggle that I could not help her with. As I left the airport, her eyes widened as she saw me take the road home. She sat there biting her lip and staring at me intently for a minute or two and then sighed. Dawn, I'm sorry. I'm being selfish. It's not that I don't want to go. It's just that I've been away for a week. I'm tired and I wanted to get home. I need to talk to you and I thought it would be easier to do it at home. But that's not fair to you. Let's go. I just need a little time to adjust. I looked over at her. Are you sure? If you want to spend some time at home and rest, we can always take a shorter trip later in the week. Meg looked at me and smiled tentatively. No, let's go now. I know you've got your plans all made and it's not fair to you to make you change them. I'm sure I'll be okay by the time we get on the water. I took her at her word and took the next exit. It took us only a few minutes to get on the right route out of town. I had to concentrate on the traffic for a while before I could settle in and put on the cruise control. When we all set, I relaxed a bit and looked over at Meg. You said you had something you wanted to talk to me about. Meg looked over at me and gave me a nervous smile. I just wanted to talk to you about the conference. It will keep until later. We can talk about it tonight once we make camp. Besides, I'm curious about something you said at the airport. You're feeling burned out. The next four hours lasted forever. Meg was determined not to talk about the conference or about what was bothering her. Every time I brought it up, she would change the subject and tell me that we would talk about it later. I could tell she was hiding something, but I couldn't pin her down. The final two hours of the trip were spent in silence as Meg tried to nap on the seat next to me. When we got to the parking lot where we would be putting in, we quietly worked together to get the canoe off the car and loaded with the gear. We locked the car and set off for our first campsite. By now, her behavior was getting me seriously worried. 
Something was very wrong and I had a feeling of dread as I tried to anticipate what she was going to tell me. When we got to the campsite, we fell into routine and set up camp and went about the chores of making dinner and getting a fire going. By unspoken agreement, we talked of inconsequential matters until we had finished eating and cleaning up. Finally, as dusk settled around us and we sat staring into the campfire, I knew that it was time to bring the matter into the open. Enough is enough. Meg, can you please tell me what in the hell is going on? What's bothering you? You've been acting strange since I talked to you last Thursday. Meg looked over at me. She was on the verge of tears and was sitting hunched over with her legs curled up. She looked totally miserable. Dawn, I have a confession to make. I did a stupid, horrible thing at the conference. I hope you can forgive me. Meg looked down at her feet and whispered, I had sex with Phil. With this pronouncement, Meg burst into tears and buried her head into her arms. For an eternity, I just sat there and stared at her. All of the insecurities and worries that had been plaguing me since she started talking about the men at the conference on Tuesday came flooding back. My worst nightmares had come true. She had gone to the conference, forgotten about me, and replaced me. Emotionally, I was in turmoil. Her announcement had come as a complete surprise. While I had been jealous of her spending time with guys I didn't know, I never imagined that she would cheat on me. I was devastated and I was angry. What the hell do you mean you had sex with Phil? I shouted. How could you do this to me? I'm normally in control of my emotions, but for a while, I lost it. Meg just sat there crying, curled up in a ball as I ran it. With every insult I hurled at her, she flinched and slipped deeper into misery. She didn't even try to defend herself. Finally, my outburst burned itself out and I sat back down and stared at her coldly. At that moment, I wasn't sure what I felt for Meg or what to do next. I still loved her, but I hated her too. I hated what she had done to us. Her confession destroyed me emotionally and devastated the trust that I had in her. Do you have any explanation for yourself? I demanded. Meg looked up at me and whispered, I'm so sorry. I don't care if you are sorry, I just want to know what happened and if you can give me a reason for it. I snarled. Over the course of the evening, Meg haltingly told me her story. She explained her relief at finding Judy's name on the conference list and her surprise at finding that four of Judy's friends were men. She told me what they talked about and how she had grown comfortable with them. She even told me that she thought about one of them trying something, but how she had been sure she could handle it. She was totally miserable as she talked. I just sat there and stared at her. As she talked, she confirmed some of my fears. She admitted that she had enjoyed the social aspects of the conference far too much for my liking. She had been flattered by the attention that she had been getting from the guys. She shamefacedly admitted that there were times when she felt like she was single. She was aware that she and Phil were pairing up, but didn't worry about it. She let her guard down with Phil because she trusted him not to try anything. The hardest part of all was hearing about Wednesday night. She didn't go into details about the sex she had with Phil. She didn't have to. I was hurt enough by her story of how she blithely ignored the warning signs and let Phil seduce her. The situation seemed surreal, she said. She noticed how the others had quickly drifted away to their own sexual pleasures leaving her with Phil. She knew she should have left, but she just sat there and let it happen. She believed that Phil would never cheat on his wife and told me why. She didn't convince me and by her tone of voice I think that we both knew she was deluding herself. On some level, she had to know what was going to happen that night if she stayed with Phil. To her credit, she didn't try to shift the blame for her actions to anyone else or pretend that she didn't do anything wrong. She guiltily acknowledged that she could not have been seduced if she hadn't been receptive to it. She took responsibility for her actions. She just told me how it happened. How Phil seduced her gradually until her libido was in a place where she would accept his advances. How feeble her efforts were to stop him. She cried as she admitted that she willingly went with Phil to have sex. She did start to tell me what happened between her and Phil in his bedroom, but I stopped her when she started to describe how they undressed each other. I was disgusted. I had no desire to hear a blow-by-blow -blow account of her sexual misconduct. The only thing that made hearing any of the details bearable was the fact that she was suffering as much as I was. Telling me about it did not excite either of us. It hurt her as much as it hurt me. When I told her to stop, that I didn't want to hear about the sex, she flashed me a grateful smile. But then she grimaced and told me that she did need to tell me something else about that night. The last part of her story was incredible. She told me that after she had had sex with Phil, they had gone back out into the living area of the suite and met up with Judy and Wayne. The mental image of my wife sitting down in nothing but a robe with another woman and two men was incomprehensible to me. While Meg was not exactly body shy, she had never been an exhibitionist. 
Phil, Wayne and Judy had told her something in confidence. They asked her never to repeat the story because too many people could be hurt. But she didn't want to keep any secrets from me. She had to tell me the whole story. She had fallen in with what can only be described as a group of swingers. She gave me the history and the absurd rules that they had created for their cheating. She even went through all of the rationalizations that they used to justify their actions. Her voice shook as she told me their argument that the sex was only for fun and did not have to affect her marriage. She described their methods of hiding their assignations and their attempts to persuade her that it could be hidden from me. They believed that the sex was meaningless to the marriage as long as no emotional bonds were formed. That was when she dropped her final bombshell of the evening. I knew she had been invited to join the competition committee. What I did not know was that the committee was the method by which they got together. She had been invited to join their sex club. After they invited her to join them, Phil asked her to spend the night with him. He wanted more sex. But she refused, although she admitted that she was still aroused and tempted to stay. However, she told me that she was confused, guilty and scared and needed time alone to think. She didn't know what to think about their arrangement. She didn't know how to respond to the offer. She was feeling guilty for giving in to temptation with Phil. Now they were asking her to knowingly enter into a long-term sexual arrangement, although they did their best to convince her it was not really cheating on me. She was skeptical of their arguments. Her confusion and her skepticism were enough to overcome her arousal. So she left. Besides, she said, she felt that sleeping with Phil would have created a level of intimacy that she did not want. She thought that sleeping and cuddling with him would be a bigger betrayal than the sex. When Meg finished describing Wednesday night, she just sat there drawn into herself staring into the embers of our campfire. I sat there mulling over what I had heard. I had questions about her behavior, but I dreaded hearing her answers. Finally, I stirred and asked her, What about the rest of the week? Did you go back and screw him some more on Thursday and Friday nights? Is that why you refused to tell me what you were doing? Meg winced at the accusing tone of my question and looked up at me with a pained look on her face. I deserve that, but no, I only had sex with him on Wednesday night. After I left the suite, I spent the night tossing and turning thinking about what I had done and what I was going to do. Dawn, I'm sorry to say this, but I did think about their offer. The sex was physical and nothing at all like the way we make love. It was just another way to have fun, like dancing or playing a game. It didn't have any special significance. It was so casual that it seemed like just another social activity that I could choose from. I don't love Phil and didn't make love to him. You are the only man I have ever made love to. I know it's a cliche, but it was just physical, just sex. I almost convinced myself that this was okay. I kept on thinking about their claim that this didn't really count as cheating because it was just friends with benefits. It didn't mean anything emotionally, it was just another benefit of being at the conference. I found myself thinking about what Phil had told me and wondering if it would really hurt you if I had sex with someone else while I was away at the conference. I knew that no amount of sex with Phil could affect the way I loved you or the way I felt about our marriage. After all, what you didn't know couldn't hurt you right. Meg shook her head disgusted with herself and went on. I don't know what I was thinking. I had breakfast with Judy on Thursday. I was confused and had a lot of questions about what was going on. When Phil came over, it felt really strange. I didn't know how to respond even though he treated me the same way that he had been treating me all along. I felt like I had a big sign around my neck telling the whole world I had cheated on you. I wasn't entirely truthful on the phone with you on Thursday. I had made plans at breakfast to get together with Judy, Dee Dee, and Rachel in Judy's room to talk. I wanted to get my questions answered. I needed to talk to them about their arrangement and how they could manage to do it. I really wanted to talk to Rachel see how it affected her relationship with her husband. Meg took a deep breath. I'm not sure, but I think that Judy had invited the guys to come over later in the afternoon. Meg stopped for a moment and looked at me intently. Dawn, I know I acted like an idiot and did some real foolish things last week, but I need you to know one thing. I love you more than anything and could never do anything to intentionally hurt you. Even when I was being a fool and trying to believe what they had told me, I was thinking about you, too. Dawn, their offer was tempting, but it was the whole package that made it exciting. I had so much fun with them and the sex was just another part of it. They were asking me to join them and have a lot of fun. It was like being given the chance to join some exclusive club. I found myself wondering if I could accept the sex as part of being in the group. It wasn't what made me want to join them. It was almost like a price I had to pay. But no matter how I was tempted, I could never do it if there was even the slightest chance that it would hurt you or our marriage. That is why I wanted to talk to Rachel and Dee Dee. Then I talked to you and realized what a fool I was. 
I didn't need to talk to Rachel or D.D. I just needed to think about us. When I got off the phone with you, I just started to cry. No matter how I justified it, it would affect our marriage because I would know that I was cheating on you. Even if I could hide it from you, I couldn't hide it from me. It would have to affect our marriage because it would affect me. I couldn't believe that I had even thought about joining them. When you told me how much you loved and trusted me never to do anything to hurt our marriage, I felt like shit. Here you were apologizing for doubting me when I had just betrayed your trust. I felt like dying because I knew that I had let you down. I called Judy and told her that I didn't want to see her or her friends anymore. I told her that I was out and that I was disgusted with myself for cheating on you. The last two days I spent in my room crying and trying to decide what I was going to do to make this up to you. That's why I didn't tell you about what I had been doing on the phone. I wanted to talk to you face to face. I only left my room to go to the sessions I had to be at. Meg looked at me with tears in her eyes. Dawn, I love you more than anything and I don't want to lose you. I know that I made a horrible mistake and hurt you terribly. I'm so sorry and hope that you were able to forgive me. When Meg finished, I just looked at her. Her confession had shaken me badly. It was bad enough that she had cheated on me. The idea that she had seriously considered joining this club was devastating. Why, Meg? I asked her in a pained tone. Why? Are you unhappy with me? Our marriage? Do you want out? No. No. She blurted out. I told you. I love you more than anything. Then why did you do this? Why did you cheat on me? I asked her miserably. Meg looked at me and turned away. She couldn't stand to look at the pain in my eyes. She stared into the fire for a moment and replied, That's what I have been trying to figure out for the past four days. Why? Dawn, this was not something that I planned to do. It just happened. I never even thought about cheating on you before. You are the only man that I have ever loved and nothing is going to change that. The only reason that I have been able to come up with is that I was weak and gave in to temptation. You know that I have had other guys come on to me before. We've talked about it. I've always been able to see right through them and tell them where to go. Meg sighed and rubbed her neck. I don't know why Phil was different. The only thing that I can come up with is that I thought he was safe. I wasn't on my guard with him. I didn't think he would cheat on his wife, so I let myself open up to him in ways that I normally guard against. By the time I realized where we were headed, he already had me turned on and I just couldn't say no. I was thinking with my emotions and not my brain. All I could think about is how good he was making me feel. I wasn't thinking about the trouble that might happen in the future. All I thought about was the moment. I gave in to the temptation. Meg stared at me intently for a moment. I know I screwed up, but I hope you can understand how it could have happened. Haven't you ever been tempted before? Haven't you ever done something that is wrong just because you couldn't help yourself? I didn't answer her. I was still looking for answers to my questions. Even if I accept the idea that this was just a momentary lapse of reason, it still doesn't explain the rest of it. How in the hell can you explain to me why would you even consider joining this sex club? I demanded. Meg flushed at my accusation and looked away. To me, this was the sticking point. I might be able to accept a one-night stand, but it hurt that she had considered a long-term arrangement. How could she even think about joining these guys on a permanent basis? I don't know how to explain it, she said with some trepidation. I wasn't thinking very well. My emotions were all over the place. I was feeling guilty but I also felt drained from the climax that Phil had given me. I was feeling emotional and overwhelmed. When we went out into the living area, the whole situation was strange. I could hear Art and Rachel going at it in the next room, and then Judy and Wayne came out in their robes, and I realized that all I was wearing was a robe too. I've never done anything like that before, and I didn't know how to respond. Then they started to tell me this story, and I couldn't believe it. I just sat there trying to make sense of it all. They must have known what emotions I was feeling. They kept telling me that I had nothing to feel guilty about. That what I had done with Phil did not hurt you or betray you. They were trying to take away my guilt. Meg sighed and looked at me. Part of me wanted to believe them. If they were right, it would be easier for me to live with what I had done. They were giving me the excuses I needed to justify my behavior. It was easier to deal with my own guilt when they were telling me that everything would be all right. But I still felt guilty and had doubts. When I left... The thing that kept running through my mind was the fact that I cheated on you. Yes, I did think about their offer, and I've already told you it was tempting. I wanted their friendship, and the sex was part of it. I had to decide if it were a price that I would pay. But, I never decided to do it. Meg looked away for a minute, and bit her lip. I have to be honest. Until I spoke to you, I didn't really think everything through. I was just thinking about it from my perspective. How it would affect me. I didn't think about how it would affect you if I lied to you and cheated on you. 
It wasn't until you told me you loved and trusted me that I realized how selfish I was being. Meg, I need to know. I demanded. You keep on saying the sex wasn't important to you and was a price you would have to pay to be part of this group. What do you mean? You said earlier that you went with Phil willingly. You wanted to have sex with him. Meg looked down. You're right. I hate to admit it, but by the time we got into his bedroom, I was ready to have sex with Phil. He had gotten me very aroused and I wanted him as much as he wanted me. He was a perfect gentleman and the sex was very exciting. He has a lot of experience and made me feel things I have never felt before. I just stared at her. This talk had turned into a nightmare. Not only had my wife cheated on me, she had topped off the evening by telling me in so many words that Phil was a better lover than I was. Now I was hurt both emotionally and in my ego. Meg looked up and saw the expression on my face. Suddenly she realized what she had just said and a horrified look crossed her face. She could see how I had taken her words. She could see how her words had affected me. Dawn, I never meant to suggest that Phil was better than you. She blurted out. Meg took a deep breath and went on. I can't deny that the sex was exciting. It was different from how we make love. Phil has a lot more experience than either you or I. He went out of his way to make sure that it was good for me. Sex is a game with him, and he showed me ways to extend the experience and enjoy what was happening. But that doesn't mean I preferred him to making love to you. I don't care how good his technique was, it wasn't the same. I miss the love and closeness I feel when we make love. Sex with Phil was just that. A physical act that didn't mean anything emotionally to either of us. It was just about making each other feel good. Please believe me. I never meant to hurt you. This was a mistake that I made. I wasn't looking for another guy to have sex with. I've never been unhappy with you in bed. You are a compassionate and considerate lover that I love to be with. You touch my heart in ways no other man could ever dream of. Sex with him could never compete with making love to you. I wouldn't trade one night with you for a thousand nights with him. No one could ever replace you in my heart. You are the one that I love and want. Meg stopped for a moment and looked at me. When I said that the sex was a price I would have to pay, I meant that it was not the reason that I wanted to join the group. It wasn't what I was looking for. The reason I was so concerned about it was because of what it might do to our marriage. I knew that the others would expect me to continue to have sex with them if I joined the group, and I didn't know if I could do it. Dawn, I wasn't out looking for sex with other men. When Meg fell silent, I stared at her. She had dropped some huge bombshells on me tonight and I was numb. But I was angry and that I didn't trust myself to make a decision right away on what she had told me. I might make a decision that I would regret later. For now, I needed to get away from her. Without a word, I got up and went over to our tent. I grabbed my sleeping pad and separated my sleeping bag from hers and made a bedroll under the canoe. I couldn't bring myself to even sleep in the same tent with her. Meg watched me silently. When she saw me pulling my gear out of the tent, she sat there with a stricken look on her face. She waited until I was done and fled into the tent. As I settled in for the night, I could hear her softly sobbing. It was not a restful night for either of us. The next morning, I got up and started to make some coffee. Meg got out of the tent and looked over at me by the fire. She wasn't sure whether she should approach me or not. Finally, she took a deep breath and walked over to the fire. Dawn, I know that I hurt you last night and I'm so sorry. I hate the fact that I destroyed your plans too. I'll start packing the gear and we can head back. This was why I didn't want to come, but I just couldn't disappoint you again. Meg turned around and started to walk back to the tent. All of a sudden, my stubborn streak asserted itself. Who said we were going back? I planned a week trip, and that is what we are going to do. You've already screwed me over enough. I'll be damned if you're going to destroy my vacation too. We're going to finish this trip. Meg stiffened at my words, but continued to pack the gear. We ate breakfast and broke camp in silence. I wasn't ready to talk to Meg, and she could see from my icy demeanor that trying to talk would only cause her more problems. Since the first canoe trip we took together, Meg and I have rarely talked while on the water. There was no need. We would enjoy nature in a companionable silence. It brought us together. The mood in the canoe that day was palpably different. The silence that day was not shared. It was a barrier between us. We didn't talk because we had nothing to say to one another. I spent the morning in stony silence glaring at Meg's back. But anger has its limits. The hours of silence lead naturally to contemplation. As the day went on, I couldn't help but think about what she had said the night before. I had to figure out my feelings. What was I going to do? I knew that I loved Meg, but could I forgive her? Did I want to separate from her or ask for a divorce? I had to deal with the knowledge that she had slept with another man. Another man had enjoyed her body, 
that had been my private domain for the past 20 years. Meg had admitted that she was weak and had given in to a moment's temptation. Could I forgive her for a one-time transgression? Temptation is an insidious thing. Sometimes it can be hard to notice as it creeps up on you. All of a sudden you are faced with a choice. It's easy to get caught up in the moment. You don't think about future consequences. All you think about is the now. What's in front of you? When you are faced with an offer that seemed too good to pass up, it's only later that you realize that spur-of-the-moment decisions can have long-lasting consequences. To make matters worse, sometimes the circumstances conspire to hide potential consequences. This can make the temptation even harder to resist. Your emotions take over or you are forced into a hasty decision. This can be the most dangerous situation of all. When a situation seems too good to be true, human nature asks, what's the catch? You look for the consequences and can avoid the spur-of-the-moment decision. When you can be spot the potential consequence, you have a basis on which to make your choice. But if the consequences are hidden, you go with the moment and forget to look for the catch. When you discover the consequences, it might be too late. For example, we have all heard of instances where someone does the right thing and returns a found wallet, a large sum of lost money, or an expensive piece of jewelry. These are the situations that are too good to be true. It's easy to spot the consequences that will flow from the decision that is made. You can see the harm that will come to the person who lost the item and the potential consequences if you are caught keeping the money or the item. You can imagine the potential rewards of doing the right thing. There is the temptation to keep the money, but you make your decision with knowledge of the consequence and this makes it easier to resist. But we have all found a quarter or a dollar on the street and picked it up without a second thought. How much effort do we expend to find the rightful owner? It's not even thought of as a temptation. You don't think about that money belonging to someone else, you just think that it is your lucky day and walk on. For each of us, the line where we stop thinking of it as a lucky find and start thinking about the person who lost the item is drawn in a different place. Meg had given in to Phil. She had told me that she hadn't thought about the consequences before she slept with Phil. She acted on the spur of the moment and gave in to her emotions. She never looked for the catch. When she did think about the consequences, her reaction was what I would hope. She had deep regrets when she realized what she had done. She refused to have sex with him again and avoided him for the rest of the conference. As I thought about what Meg had done, I began to think if there was still a future for us. It hurt to know that she had sex with some other guy. Meg had touched on the issue of temptation last night and had asked me some troubling questions that I had ignored. There have been occasions where I have faced similar temptations. I can understand how hard it is to stay in control. There has been three times during my time with Meg that I have faced temptation with varying degrees of success. Rationally, I could understand how Meg's emotions could have caused her to be unfaithful to me. Rationally, I was pleased that she rejected further involvement as soon as she thought about the potential consequences. But emotionally, I was torn up. All I could see was Meg opening her legs for another man, seriously considering a long-term relationship. These thoughts made me so angry that I forgot about my actions. All I wanted to do was scream. I realized that I would have to face up to my emotions. If I wanted my marriage to continue, I needed to figure out a way to get past this. By the end of the day, I was emotionally exhausted. We pulled into the bank and started to make camp quietly. I was no longer visibly mad at Meg. I just did not know how to deal with the situation. As Meg pulled my sleeping gear out of the canoe, she looked at me with a question on her face. She didn't know if I was going to share the tent with her or not. I just gestured for her to leave it. I didn't know either. After dinner, I sat there staring into the campfire, brooding. Meg had made a few efforts to start conversation, but I was withdrawn. I was still trying to make sense of everything. I knew we had to talk, but I wanted to get a handle on my emotions first. What a mess. I exclaimed into the silence. Christ Meg, how could you do it? How could you mess us up so bad? Meg started to apologize again, but I waved her off. I know Meg you're sorry. I'm sorry too, but that doesn't get us anywhere. I shook my head. Look, I thought about this all day long. I think I can even understand how it happened, but God damn it, it hurts. I just can't get the picture of that a-hole doing you out of my head. I glanced over at Meg in frustration. Sometimes I wish you never told me. I believe you when you say that it's not going to happen again. I know he doesn't mean anything to you. You handled the situation yourself, so why didn't you just keep quiet? There's nothing I can do about it now, so what's the use in telling me? Meg looked at me in shock. She couldn't understand how I could even think that not knowing would be preferable to living with the image of her screwing someone else burned into my mind. I, I had to tell you. We have to deal with this. 
Ignoring what happened is not going to make it go away. If I didn't tell you about this, it would just make it worse. You know I can never hide anything from you. Hell, you figured out that something was wrong over the phone. You would have seen that I was feeling guilty about something as soon as I got home. You would have gotten mad because I was hiding something from you and it would cause even more problems. It would have been a lot worse for both of us if you found out from someone else that I cheated on you. My lying would have made it worse. Meg stared at me with a sad look in her eyes. Besides, I know how shitty it feels to be in the dark. To know something happened, but not what. To be humiliated by hearing what happened from someone else. Meg looked over at me with a worried expression. What happens now? I don't know, Meg. We both have a lot to think about. I know that I still love you and my mind is telling me to forgive you. But it's still too soon. I'm still hurting too much to forgive you right now. Meg, I'm scared. Something is wrong with our marriage and I don't know how to fix it. We both love each other, but why do we keep screwing up? If our marriage is so happy, why are we so open to temptation? Neither of us resisted too hard when we were offered something different. You told me last night that you wanted the whole package. It wasn't the sex that you were attracted to, but the fun the group was having. Tonight, you tell me that this fun included flirting and acting like you were out on a date with Phil. That scares me worse than the fact you had sex with him. You were out looking for something that he was giving you. It makes me feel like you're bored and looking for ways to replace me. Hell, you like the romance. Meg gaped at me and shook her head in denial, but I had developed a full head of steam. I know, you love me and don't want to divorce me. But let me ask you this. What would have happened if the sex didn't happen and they just asked you join this social club at the conference every year? Would you have done it? I didn't wait for her answer. Think about that, Meg. If you feel the need to find excitement dating some other guys, what does that say about our marriage and me? Meg just sat there with tears in her eyes. She started to speak, but I stopped her. Not tonight, Meg. We're both too tired to deal with this anymore tonight. Besides, we both have some thinking to do. Let's go to bed and talk about this some more tomorrow night. Meg nodded her acceptance and got up to walk to the tent. After a few steps, she stopped with a question. Dawn, where are you sleeping tonight? I'll sleep in the tent, but Meg, I'm not ready to cuddle with you or share a sleeping bag. The rest of that canoe trip was intense. By day we would paddle in silence, each of us thinking about the prior night's conversation. No, the silence wasn't shared, but it was no longer a barrier between us. It was a start. At night, we sat and discussed our marriage. We talked about what was right and what was wrong and how we could work to fix it. We were both scared. Meg's confession had opened a big can of worms that needed to be dealt with. We had not worked on our relationship with the care and concern that we had spent on our kids, our jobs, or the rest of our lives. We had drifted along thinking everything was okay without looking ahead. Yes, we cuddled and talked at night, but we weren't spending enough time together. I wasn't giving Meg the romance she needed outside the bedroom. We had fallen into a parent trap. We hadn't thought about ourselves for a long time. Our lives were tied up in Brad and Sarah and outside interests. Even our canoe trips and hikes had taken a back seat to more pressing concerns. We talked about what would happen in a few years when the kids left home for college. We had better start working on us if we were going to be ready for the empty nest. We also figured out that my earlier problems had indirectly affected Meg's actions at the conference. Meg didn't act out of boredom. Subconsciously, she acted with the belief that there would be minimal consequences for her behavior. We talked a lot about consequences and our failures to communicate fully. We understood that our marriage was on shaky ground. The trust had been eroded on both sides. One further slip by either of us could end it, no matter how much we loved one another. We promised ourselves that we would continue to talk and work on bridging the gap that had been created. We also promised that we would both think about the consequences of our actions. We agreed to never do anything apart that we wouldn't do in front of each other. And we talked about sex. Even though sex had never been the raison d'etre for our marriage, we had neglected it for too long. We had gotten into a rut. We settled for simply satisfying each other. We never tried to bring it to the next level. We decided it was time to change our mindset. It wasn't that we wanted to get wild and try exotic new things, but we decided that it couldn't hurt to spice it up a little. At the very least, we needed to slow down and take our time. I wanted to give Meg the fireworks she had seen with Phil, and she wanted to see how she could make my climax more intense as well. It wasn't a fun week. At times, my anger would come to the forefront, and I would lash out at Meg. At times, she lashed out at me as well. Many nights ended in tears, but we kept at it. It may not have been fun, but it was necessary. I learned a big lesson that week. 
I could have focused entirely upon my anger and blamed Meg for what had happened. I could have spent the week berating her for her stupidity and sleeping with Phil. I could have given in to the temptation to focus on the immediate problem and avoid looking at the big picture. But I didn't. I chose to look beyond the immediate problem to find the source. I chose to fix what was wrong with our marriage. I remained angry with Meg, but I tried to channel that anger into something that would help both of us in the long run. By the end of the week, I was sharing a sleeping bag with Meg again. I wasn't ready to have sex with her yet, but it did feel good to hold her in my arms again. Truth be known, I enjoyed cuddling with Meg as much as she enjoyed it. I knew that eventually my anger would fade and I would be ready to take our relationship back, but first I had to get the image of Meg and Phil out of my mind. By the time we paddled back to the car on Saturday, I had reached a conclusion. For my own ego, I needed to meet Phil. I had to face down the man who had slept with my wife. Meg wasn't too happy with the idea. She had seen the progress we had made and was afraid that seeing Phil would just set me off again. She also was worried about what I might do. She was concerned that I would confront Phil or let his wife Stacy know about what had happened. She felt miserable about the possibility that she would be involved in the destruction of Phil's marriage. I told her that I needed her to trust me. I wasn't interested in destroying Phil's marriage. I didn't want to go macho and threaten him to stay away from Meg. I didn't even plan to tell Stacy about Phil's extracurricular activities. But I did want to teach him a lesson, and I needed to make sure that he knew that Meg was mine and mine alone. Facing down Phil was the first step in making a decision about the invitation to join the competition committee. We had spent a lot of time last night talking about whether Meg should accept the invitation. Meg wanted to reject it, she didn't want the threat in our marriage, and she felt uncomfortable about the invitation. She felt it had been offered to her under false pretenses. She hadn't earned it. I wasn't so sure. While I did worry about the time she would have to spend away from home, I knew that if our marriage were to survive we needed to learn to trust each other again. I couldn't keep her at home forever. Besides, I was proud of her. Even if she didn't think she deserved to be on the committee, I did. I wanted her to have the forum for her ideas. I just wanted to make sure that her work on the committee didn't affect our marriage. I wanted to make sure that she wouldn't face peer pressure to get back together with Judy, Phil, and the gang. My plan was relatively simple. I wanted to keep Phil off balance. I wanted to meet with him without his being sure what I knew. I would confront him on his own turf because I wanted his wife present. I hoped that I might be able to give him a taste of his own medicine. When I explained to Meg what I wanted to accomplish, she reluctantly agreed to help me. Although Meg didn't like it, she was willing to trust me. We packed the car and drove towards Phil's hometown. That night we stopped at a motel and Meg called Phil's house. She explained that we were on our way back from a trip and wanted to meet with him. We had questions about the committee. She told me later that he sounded surprised to hear from her. I think he had expected her to reject the invitation. Reluctantly, he agreed to meet with us the next day after lunch. He was even more reluctant when Meg told him that I had specifically asked if Stacy could be there too. She said he got alarmed at that but that he couldn't press her for details because I made sure he could hear me in the background. All she told him was that I wanted to talk to her as well. I hope it worried him. I wouldn't mind if he had a sleepless night wondering if the shit was about to hit the fan. When we pulled up to Phil's house, he came out to greet us. Phil reminded me of countless jocks that I have known throughout the years. He had the look and the attitude of a big man around campus. He was about four or five inches taller than I was and looked to be in fairly good shape. When I got out of the car, he looked me over and dismissed me as a physical threat. I'm used to it. I'm short and thin. More than one jock has underestimated me through the years and often their attitude towards me caused them to underestimate me in all areas. I was counting on Phil to do the same. I would take any advantage I could get. His smile was forced and uncomfortable. He wasn't used to facing the husbands of his playmates. I wanted to make him sweat as long as I could. So, I shook his hand and looked him in the eye. I stared at him for a moment without letting go of his hand. So you're Phil. Meg has told me all about the conference. I wanted to meet the man who spent so much time with my wife. My comments were made in a neutral tone. I wanted him wondering just how much Meg had told me. Phil studied my face for a moment trying to figure out what I knew. I kept my best poker face and he glanced away nervously and escorted us to the patio. We were just sitting down when Stacy came out with a tray of drinks. If Phil was your typical jock, Stacy was the girl next door. She had a friendly open face and a personality that made you want to like her immediately. She was the type of woman that would be attractive to the guy who preferred Mary and to Ginger or Betty over Veronica. In short, she was cute, not beautiful. 
I think Phil was surprised when Meg and I started out by asking him legitimate questions about the committee. We did have concerns and we saw no reason not to get the answers. After a while, he started to relax. He was convinced that Meg hadn't told me what had happened. I caught him giving Meg a couple of speculative glances. He was wondering if Meg had changed her mind about the extracurricular activities. I decided it was time to shift the focus. Thanks for answering our questions, Phil. When we were discussing whether Meg should accept the invitation, we realized that we needed more information and you have helped a lot. But there is one aspect of the committee that I am very concerned about and I hope that both you and Stacy can help us out. Stacy looked puzzled. I'm not sure how I can help. I don't know anything about how the committee works. It's not the committee I'm worried about, Stacy, I replied. It's the rest of it. I'm concerned about the amount of time that Meg will be away from home. That was why I wanted to talk to you. I don't want our marriage to be affected by our jobs. I want to talk to another spouse about what it is like. Meg told me the committee meets four times a year, and she would have to be away for about three weeks a year. I don't want to pry, but has this caused any problems for you and Phil? How have you been able to handle the separation? Although Phil looked uncomfortable, Stacy smiled. It hasn't been a problem. Of course I miss him, but I know it's something that he needs to do for his job. But don't you ever get jealous? I got jealous of Meg by the third day she was at the conference. She was done by 2.30 every day and off doing something. Every night she was out at parties having a good time. I got jealous of all the time she was spending dancing and socializing with the guys at the conference. How do you deal with all the partying that goes on? Paul shot me a dirty look. I hadn't accused him of anything, but I was bringing the conversation into dangerous territory. I was raising questions that he didn't want asked, but there was no way that he could stop it without it looking suspicious. Stacy looked troubled. What do you mean? What parties? I smiled to myself. I had suspected that Phil had not been overly forthcoming with the details of what he was doing while he was away. I couldn't see how he could have and remained happily married. From what Meg had told me, the social club had been going strong for years. That was something I could tell her about. For now, I would keep quiet about the sex, but it was time that she learned about the fun Phil had while he was away. I told Stacy what Meg had done at the conference. I told her about all of the afternoon activities. I told her about the dinners, the parties, and the receptions. I didn't lay it on thick or accuse anyone of doing anything improper. But I didn't hide the fact that Meg and Phil had spent a lot of time together outside the meetings. Stacy already knew that Phil was part of a social group from the committee that did a lot together. She just wasn't aware that half of the group were women. Stacy didn't look too happy. She was shooting angry looks at both Meg and Phil. Meg looked uncomfortable, but didn't look away from Stacy's gaze. Phil was just sitting there with a stunned look on his face. Some of his chickens had come home to roost, and he knew that he had a lot of explaining to do. That's why I was jealous, Stacy. She was out having a great time, and I was stuck at work. From what Meg told me, the committee meetings are the same. The meetings get done mid-afternoon, and they all get together to socialize for the rest of the time. Even though I trust Meg, it doesn't mean that I like it when she is out with some guy I don't know. I shot Phil a pointed glance and smiled before turning back to Stacy. You didn't know about this? Phil was halfway to his feet and started to babble some type of explanation, but Stacy got up and stormed from the room without a backward glance. A few seconds later, I heard a door slam in the rear of the house. Phil looked over at me with an angry look on his face. What the hell was that about? Are you trying to screw up my marriage? He snarled. I was going to ask you the same thing. I replied mildly. All I did was tell her what went on. Something you should have done a long time ago. You're the one that was with my wife. Phil tried to bluff his way through. I don't know what you're talking about. Bullshit. I responded forcefully. Meg told me about the conference, Phil. She told me everything. I know you were flirting with her and how you got paired up at the parties on Monday and Tuesday. I lowered my voice and continued. She told me about Wednesday night too, Phil. She told me about what went on in the hospitality suite. I know you had sex with her, Phil. The color drained from Phil's face and he looked over to Meg for confirmation. She didn't look too pleased either. The fact that he had failed to tell Stacy anything bothered her. She was beginning to rethink her opinion of Mr. Phil Grant. Phil started to deny the accusation but then slumped back down in his chair defeated. What do you want? He asked wearily. Just don't tell Stacy. She'll kill me if she finds out. What do I want? I responded sarcastically. Can you put my marriage back the way it was? Maybe you can tell me why I should care about your marriage when you obviously didn't care about mine. I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt your marriage. Phil replied desperately. It didn't mean anything. 
We were just having fun. I wasn't looking to have an affair with her or anything. No, you just wanted to have sex with her. You don't think that didn't affect my marriage? Tell you what, if it doesn't mean anything, I'll take Stacy back home with me for the week and just have some fun with her. I'm sure you won't mind. After all, it will just be sex right. Phil's eyes blazed at this suggestion and I gave a bitter laugh. What's the matter, Phil? It doesn't seem so innocent when you are the who will sit at home, does it? If it didn't mean anything, you wouldn't mind if Stacy did it too. Don't give me any bullshit about it not meaning something. If you're going to screw around with someone else's wife, it means something. What the hell is wrong with you anyway? I demanded. Why are you screwing around when you have a wife like Stacy at home? Don't you know she is going to find out sooner or later? If you keep on screwing around on her, she is going to get hurt. If you love her like you said, you'll think about what you are doing and stop it. Meg had been watching the interplay with interest and decided to chime in. I can't believe that I almost listened to you. I was ready to trust you when you told me that it wouldn't affect my marriage. I didn't know that your marriage was built on not telling Stacy anything. I hope she tears you a new one. I only want one thing from you, Phil. Stay away from me. Phil slumped his head and nodded his acceptance. Are you going to tell Stacy? He pleaded. Meg and I looked at each other for a minute and I finally shook my head. No, I'll keep your secret for now. Stacy seems like a nice girl and I don't want her to get hurt. But if you ever come near Meg in the future or try to get back at her, telling Stacy is just a small part of what I will do to you. Let's get out of here, Meg. As we left the house, Phil sat there with this head in his hands. I didn't want to ruin his marriage. I just wanted him to learn the consequences of screwing around with my wife. The rest was up to him. I didn't plan on giving him any more thought. I had my own marriage to save. Meg and I did make it, although it took time to get our marriage back to where it had been. Trust is a hard thing to earn and easy to lose. It took time before I was able to trust Meg in social situation when I wasn't there. I didn't worry about her looking for trouble. I worried about her getting blindsided again. But, in time, she showed me that she had learned her lesson. I learned it too. We knew the consequences of screwing up. They were scary enough that neither of us wanted to tempt fate by giving in. Meg did join the competition committee. Together we decided that it was too good of a career opportunity for her to pass up. But we addressed the social aspects and minimized her time away from the family and me. Meg discovered that it was usually possible to condense the committee meeting trips. The winter meeting became an annual family trip to the capital. We also realized that the kids and I could vacation near the resort where the annual conference was held. As for Phil, Judy, and the rest, their social group didn't last too much longer. The members started to drop out rapidly. Judy and Wayne were the first two to leave. It turned out that they had gotten together on a more permanent basis and were planning on getting married. All of a sudden, the idea of maintaining a friends with benefits relationship with Phil, D.D., and the rest didn't seem so innocent anymore. Phil had a change of heart as well. Meg and I scared him when we showed up at his house. He followed our lead and started to bring Stacy and his family to the conferences and meetings. I would see them around occasionally, but for some reason he never wanted to come over to say hi. With half of the group gone, things weren't as much fun for D.D., Sam, Art, and Rachel. It was also more difficult to hide what was going on. I heard rumors of a confrontation between Rachel's husband and Art a few years later, but the matter was hushed up. Rachel did resign from the committee rather abruptly, however. Meg and I are finding more time to spend together. Sarah's a junior now and is starting to think about college. With Brad already in college, we think we are ready to deal with the empty nest. We are looking forward to the chance to spend more time together. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.